Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 947 of the Juice Box Podcast. My guest today has had type 1 diabetes since he was a year old. We're going to talk a lot about kidney disease, transplants, and type 1 diabetes. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you're looking to save 35% on clothing, towels, or bedding, go to CozyEarth.com and use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. If you'd like to get a free year's supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order of AG1, you can do that with my link, drinkag1.com forward slash juicebox. Looking for community around type 1 diabetes? Check out Juicebox Podcast Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. What else? Hmm, gotta be something else. Oh, check out the Diabetes Pro Tip series. It begins at episode 210 in your podcast player. Speaking of podcast players, have you followed or subscribed? Please do. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G7 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. Arden is wearing the Dexcom G7 right now. It is tiny, it is easy to use, and it's accurate. You're going to love it. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Oh, you know what else about that Dexcom? I just read a headline today that says Dexcom G7 receives Health Canada approval. Congratulations, Canada. Happy Canada Day. Wait, that's actually a holiday there. Never mind. Today's podcast is also sponsored by the Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter. ContourNext.com forward slash juice box. You can get the same meter Arden has or a number of other accurate meters from Contour, all at my link, contournext.com forward slash juicebox. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. It's late at night. I'm punchy. Sorry. Bye. My name is Ragnar, but most people call me Rags. 52 years old. Diagnosed when I was a year old. I live in uh, Hawthorne, California. We've just been here about a year. But I grew up in Manhattan, Sausalito and Manhattan Beach. And that's about it. Wow. Um, do me a favor. Don't let that microphone on that wire touch something, okay? Okay. And right. me... you were diagnosed when you were a year old? Yeah. 51 years ago? Yeah. Oh, my. All right. Well, we got stuff to talk about then. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm assuming you don't remember anything about being no. diagnosed. No. I, I just know I've been di- diabetic the whole time. So um, my mom, uh, I got the story. My mom. My mom was dropping me off at daycare and I kept getting strep throat all the time. And so she finally went to the hospital to have me checked out and they did a couple tests and they said, Oh, he has diabetes. And my parents are like, well, what's that? And then my dad called one of his friends, uh, Dr. Carl white, who's a friend of his from Michigan. And my dad said, well, what's diabetes? And he kind of told them that he has high blood sugar, you know, and then that was kind of about it. So they were given an orange. And did a couple of shots in the orange, and then they said, "There you go. Good luck. We'll talk to you soon." And that was about it. <laughs> well, hey, you know what? I'm changing yeah. my thought all of a sudden. You're still yeah. you're alive. It must have worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked out okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was put on a regular insulin and um, lente insulin at the time in 1970, and um, that was what well, I was done. Two shots a day, urine testing. My mom would wake me up in the middle of the night and test my urine which we know now would meant nothing. But at the time that she, she thought that was the best thing to do. They won't give me any, any tools like you guys have today, but your mom, um, your mom would wake you every night. Like to, to every night you- test my yeah, pee, pee in a cup or, or well, I, I don't know how it worked. I have no idea. Wow. Or, you know, if I was one, I was probably just peeing re- regardless. <laughs> You'd probably wake me up and just try to <laughs> get me to pee. <laughs> oh, she must have been. She must have been so concerned. You know. Oh yeah, just yeah. just like all the parents are today that we you know, are on the, the Facebook group, and you know we hear it's the same same amount of fear and anxiety and all that stuff. That yeah. 
Well, no she, tools. Yeah, so. no, exactly. No, she was just scrambling to get any kind of data that she could, probably just to make yeah. herself feel comfortable. You know, before we move forward, and you want me to call you Rags? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, before we move forward, Rags, uh, I have to tell you how disappointed I am in myself that I am 51 years old, and yet I started to, like, I, I have a little whiteboard here, and I, I started to, like, go, I was like, I'm going to subtract you know, 2022 from 52. And then, <laughs> and then you said 1970. And I thought, oh yeah, the year before I was born, because yeah. <laughs> he's a year older than me. It's really, I can't tell you how disappointed I was with myself. <laughs> well, you really couldn't use that, that, that stellar math you always have. So, you know. I just, I, I really just thought for a second, I thought, stop, just, you know what? End the recording. It's over. You're an idiot. <laughs> 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 My goodness. So are your parents around still? Yeah, they are. My 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 mom was uh five miles from me. My dad lives in Venice Beach, California. So they're both here. So that's thank God for that. I'm really grateful for that. So yeah. how how much of the because I imagine you transitioned through a number of different care, you know, yeah. management systems through the years. H- at what age do you think your parents stopped knowing about your diabetes care? Uh, um, probably after my, I had a kidney pancreas transplant. So probably after my transplant, when I started doing, you know, the pump thing and the, and then I transitioned to loop. So they don't quite understand the loop and the pump thing. They, Mm -hmm. they don't really have an idea about, they know that I do that thing and they know I know I do this new thing. And my dad thinks, you know, he tries to understand what loop is, but it's, it's just too hard to explain. And he's kind of, he knows I take care of myself. And that's, that. yeah, after college, I pretty, I, yeah, after college, pretty much should t- take care of myself. So. Yeah. Your mom didn't come up to you like when you're thirties and ask you to pee on something or anything like that. No, but she always says, so she should go raggy. Um, how, how are you? And then that means how is your diabetes? Not how are you? So I finally got to a point like, you want to ask me about how I'm doing, or do you want to know how I'm how my diabetes is doing? So he finally got over to that. But she'll also say, "Hey, Raggy, are you, are you low right now?" You know, she can tell when I'm low. Everyone can tell I'm low before I'm low. Even my, you know, Dutch son will say I'm low, and, and um, but my wife and and my mom can both tell I'm low. So wow, well, wow. so let's figure this out a little bit. So you yeah. had you had a double transplant. How long ago? Yeah, uh, that was in nineteen. 19- 90 was that no 19 no no that wasn't that was in 1997 i had my first kidney transplant in 1990 wow. and then i had my kidney pancreas in 1997 that lasted quite a long time so okay that, that was nice not to be di- that have diabetes anymore and, and so oh, okay well hold on there's a lot yeah. here so yeah there's, y- lot. yeah there's a lot here for sure so you made it basically 20 years before you needed kidneys yeah all right and that entire 20 year time you're managing in a way that mostly people don't do anymore. Yeah, I was doing, um, so I did the regular Lente for a long time. Then I went to diabetic camp, um, Bearskin Meadow camp when I was like six. And I uh, learned a lot there uh, my whole life. I learned everything at diabetes camp because we had, you'd go up to the table to, you'd go to send in line and the doctor would tell you what insulin to do. But I remember when I was sick, this doctor, named, we called her doc, asked me what I thought I should do for my insulin. So I was like, well, you know, I said some number and she's like, well, no, let's cut it back quite a bit. So <laughs> you go to the shot line and get your insulin that you had to get. And you would get your shot line and wait about a half an hour before you could go to breakfast. So <clears throat> that was their pre-bolusing without knowing I was pre-bolusing mm-hmm. um, at the time. And so, yeah, so I did that, uh, the regular Lente. And then, and then when I was in high school, I had a lot of difficult times in high school because it was just kind of shooting uh, darts in a dark, dark room and hopefully you hit the board. But, you know, I'd, I'd have insulin reactions at school and wake up in an ambulance and that kind of stuff went on for me. Hmm. Um, so there's, know. there's no real, uh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. I was going to say method, but that was the method, but there was, that, it was either that, working or it wasn't working. The goal was just right. for you not to die today. Is that pretty much right? I, I think so. That was pretty much the, the idea, you know, and I had a couple of close calls there. Um, one time I, I had a really bad insulin reaction and seizure and my dad tried doing the glue gone thing with the needle and the thing and it, all the needles broke off. The needle broke and, and uh, my dad called the paramedics and the paramedics came and, and the story was 
One guy, Lance, happened to be behind because the, the rig and the paramedic truck were out, and he grabbed the ambulance from the uh, from the ambulance bay, and he came and kind of saved my life. He turned me out. I was aspirating, so I mean, my dad put orange juice down my mouth and all this other stuff, and I was like choking on my own on the fluid. And so the guy turned me upside down and swung me around, and then drove me to the hospital. It's a whole big like big deal. Wow, I was in the hospital and stuff like that. So if you're someone seizing and they're can't really control their fluid. Don't put orange juice down their mouth because they can, they can go, go do a thing called aspirate. Yeah. Which fluids gets in the lungs and it's a, it's a mess. What, um, how many times do you think that happened to you? Like some, some version of like being that low? Oh, uh, quite a bit for me. I, I can't even have a number for you. It was a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, I see, I, you know, um, you know, enough that, that, the kids knew that I was at high school, knew I was diabetic, you know, so I was like, um, enough, but not enough. They also just treated me like a normal kid too. But I had, I had situations in, in school where I, I had to, you know, then I was doing blood sugar tests by the, uh, you know, so at the age of, so I think at the age of 10 at diabetes camp, we did, we did blood sugar tests for the first time with the guillotine sugar test. You put the thing on the strip and wait two minutes not five seconds, but wait two minutes and then wipe it off. Wait another minute. And <laughs> it took a long time to do a blood sugar test. Je- Jenny, um, Jenny was just telling me about the, the guillotine uh, po- yeah. pokers the, the other day while we were recording. It's funny you brought that up. Uh, yeah. It was just like, it was, sc- you know, it was scary, but you had to do it and you had to really squeeze your finger and it was just, you know, mm. but not looking now. So I need to do a blood sugar test. I'm like, no problem. What? Five seconds. Oh, got it. You know, <laughs> it, all, like, it all just seems real easy <laughs> to you. I imagine. Yeah. 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 I'm like, Oh, that's great. You know? And then, and then I had my, so I had my, so I, so in college I was cycling, I was playing water polo and, and cycle and bike racing. And the doctor at the time was a new doctor, Dr. Mary Simon. And she said, let's try this thing called ultra lente. So at that time at camp, I was a, uh, I was a camp counselor. I was in charge of the sports program or something. I can't remember. But so we spent an entire summer, like three months trying to figure out my ultra lente dose. And that was to me, the best control I ever had. I mean, at the time was the best control I had. Mm -hmm. I was probably doing like 10 to 20 blood sugar tests, glucose tests a day. And then I would just do little shots of, of regular the whole time, you know, the fast acting, quote unquote, fast acting insulin. Um, and that was really good control at the time, but I was still doing blood sugar tests all the time. And, and it was still kind of a shot in the dark. Cause you just get that moment of that, whatever your blood sugar is at that time is what your blood sugar is. There was no like forward thing of, yeah. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm dropping down later. I'm like, um, uh, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> not well. We did a, um, yesterday Arden had a, her pump site went bad, but she hadn't eaten all morning. So we kind of didn't know because it was able to hold right. her. It was hold her, her nice and steady without food. Right. And yeah. so I started, she's at college. I started looking at it thinking, boy, I hope she changes this pump before, um, you know, before she eats. And she went to class and came back and I guess she thought, well, let me try to like get one more bolus out of this thing. And she put her insulin in and it was just from there. It was just a slow climb. Like just, it was happening. It was 90, 95, a hundred. I was like, this is not working, you know? So, um, I texted her and I said, Hey, I think this pot is shot, you know, like, I think you got to get away from it. And she's like, well, after I do this and this, I'll look at it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that turned into like the highest blood sugar she's had in a long time, yeah. but, you know? And so I'm telling you, she was like 300 and, and I was like, Arden, listen, I know like you got to change the pod now. And she's like, okay, I will, I will. But it took her like four hours to do it. Right. And um, then she did it. And I said, okay, like, would you like some help getting this blood sugar down? Because it's a new pump. It's not going to work as well as you expect. And she's like, yeah, 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 okay. And so I'm like, all right. I'm like, I'm asking a lot of uh, consent all of a sudden. Right. But, right. And, I, and I'm, and, and I, you know, I'm taking that from stories, uh, you know, in my own life where I've, I've looked at Arden and seen her like diabetes before I've seen her and learn from people right. like you who just told me like, you know, your mom only asks how your diabetes is not you. So I'm like, so she says, okay, you know, like, give me a hand here. I said, okay, well, she's looping. I said, open the loop up. I said, yeah. let's get a nice stable, um, a basil going. And I said, let's make a bolus like this, you know? So we put the bolus in and she went to class, uh, in the afternoon 
And I texted her and I said, I'm going to help you watch this because I know you're in class, but there's going to be a moment where we're going to have to close the loop and try to catch it. So we got to a spot where we did and uh, it, it almost worked. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. was like it was coming yeah. down, coming down. And then boom, we we closed, we opened the loop up, let the loop work. It took the basil away. And I don't know how this happened, but it ended up where she was 70 right when she got to dinner. Oh, it was like God. the dumbest <laughs> luck. You know what I mean? Like she had don't get me wrong. She has stuff with her. So like yeah. I'm texting her and I'm like, hey, listen, why don't we slow this down a little bit with a couple of gummy bears or whatever you have on you? Like, you know, I know you're going to dinner, but like, let's just throw something in here. Well, she didn't respond to me, which, right. which I now know means I disagree with you. <laughs> 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 so, um, so she got herself, you know, but she, I knew she had to walk back to her room. So I was a little like, I don't want her walking mm -hmm. while she's falling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, and I'll tell you what I do for my own comfort is that I, I use find my iPhone. So we have, we all have iPhones and right. it's one of the things that my kids know, like if you want to own an iPhone and you think I'm going to pay for it, I need to be able to see where the phone is. And so like I could see her walking back to where she was going for food. I knew she was in the cafeteria um, when her blood sugar got to 70, but it was still dropping really slowly. Right. And, and this girl like boluses. Like, you know what I mean? Like she, yeah. she, she puts her, she puts it in, but it's loop and she's now at 65. It's not going to bolus for her. Mm. And, um, and you know, so I'm like, I'm trying not to freak out, Rags. You know what I mean? Like right. I know, yeah, she, yeah. I know yeah. she's, I can see she's where the food is. She's, yeah. she, I know she sees my text. I know she understands what's happening. And, um, and finally I could tell she ate cause she leveled out and then, I said, you should put in the suggested insulin now because it's not going to bolus till it gets above the cutoff, which I think we have set at like 66 or something like that. Right. And, um, and she's, and she didn't answer me, but I could see on night scout that she put the bolus in and yeah, it, it was amazing. She went up to like 145 and leveled out and was good all Came night. Oh my yeah. God. 99 all night long, like really fantastic. But all that's only yeah. possible because of the data and the communication and the technology. Yeah. And I'm, I'm imagining you and that you were in this very same situation every day of your life. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you, and you didn't know it. So here, so here, this one time I was at school at college, I was at California state university, Chico. And I knew my blood sugar was low. I did a test. I was low. So I was like making myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at the time, which was a good thing because you have the jelly it gives you up and the, Bread kind of keeps a medium and the peanut butter lasts a long time. So I'm like, I don't have PBJ. That's good. You know? hmm. So all of a sudden the phone rings. So to all those younger people out there, you used to have a, a, a tie on the phone. So you'd have to be on a cord and phone and it would only reach so far. So my mom is on the phone. I go, oh, hi, mom. Blah, blah. Oh, hi, Reggie. You, you sound kind of low. Yeah, I know I'm taking care of it. So I'm trying to make the rest of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but the phone doesn't quite reach in my hands. I can't quite reach to finish making the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, so I'm like, mama, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, but I didn't know how to say mom, Hey, I'm low. I need to get off the phone. What I would do today. But then I'm like, Oh, I'll keep talking. All of a sudden in the background to hear her. Woo, woo, woo. I said, we had two phone lines at the time. I said, mom, did you call the, the fire department? Yeah, honey, I did. Cause you sounded really low. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, so she was at the same time protecting you and keeping you from eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my, so my my uh, my my mom's husband, my stepdad, Norm, uh, called the ambulance on the other line. <laughs> so I gotta go. So I hung up the phone. Man, this man is eating the sandwich. I was pretty low by the time those guys showed up. So I come in the house and I. So yeah, give me some. I had some sugar. I said, "Can I sign the AMA?" Which is against medical advice. I'm like, yeah, sure. So they signed. I signed the AMA and they left. But it still, it's just like back then. If my mom had had the Dexcom, she could have seen. You know, I was low. And I was taking. You know, I said, "Hey, I'm taking care of it." Like, oh, you know, it would have been a different story. But back then, it was just you know by yeah. my voice. Well, like, honey, you, you know, this so, whole hey. story seems like a humble brag that you had two phone lines growing up in your house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, huh? So that was that was a good thing, probably. People so. listening would have no idea what a big deal that was that you had two different yeah. phone numbers in phone your house. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I just think that 
I mean, I just I don't know. Like while you're talking, I can I just imagine how often your blood sugar was up and dropping, and and yeah. and because you were using insulin that didn't work as rapidly, the lows yeah. the lows were bad, and they yeah. would get you eventually, but it took longer to get to it. Whereas now with a faster acting insulin, if you're you know if you're sixty. 55, 50, you're going to be 30 in 10 minutes if you're falling like yeah. that, you know? So yeah. your falls were slower sometimes, but. Yeah. So but that was, in, that was in 1990. So I was using the Humalog then. Oh, by so then it was it Humalog. Was, okay. Yeah. So you were dropping fast, but you fast. didn't know you were dropping fast. So you were like, you were shaking, mm. you know? And then right, boom, you, there it is. Yeah. You, yeah. You couldn't talk, you know, your friends like, Hey, dude, you need some sugar, huh? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, help me out. So. So um, in that yeah. in that first twenty years, do you have any idea that you're going to have health problems, or do you feel like you're doing well? Well, no. I, I my thing was I had so my kidney disease came from streptococcal glomerular nephritis, which is a big word for strep throat causes latent kidney disease. So I had strep throat when I was a baby, huh. and then I didn't show any signs of kidney dysfunction until I was like thirteen. So the diabetes didn't cause my, my kidney failure, but it didn't help it, put it that way. Right, right. Oh, no kidding. So, well, that's, I, yeah. I was going to Google that, but I got lost. So Yeah, so, yeah. streptococcal. It's really hard to spell. It's, it's streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So it's yeah, strep throat, and the glomerular is the functional unit of the kidney, and itis is swelling of that functional unit of the kidney. So, wow, so strep throat crazy. causes – so if you don't treat strep throat aggressively – like they did back in the 1970s, or six, late 60s, early 70s, then you have this latent kidney thing. <clears throat> Whereas today, if that happens, they, they're right on the uh, strep throat, like right away, because they don't want people to have kidney disease later. PSGN so. is what they call it. Yeah. A yeah. rare Post complication. Yeah. A rare complication yeah. from a prior group, a strep infection. It's a kidney yeah. disease that can develop after infections caused by bacteria called a streptococcus. How about that? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. some crappy luck. Yeah. Um, no kidding. So uh, how, what's the first sign you have that your kidneys aren't functioning? Um, just the doctor. I did blood tests, you know, like to see the, the endocrinologist, you know, his name is Dr. Fefferman. He's since passed, but he was a great doctor. And he said, Oh, it looks like your kidney is, you know, your kidneys aren't working that well. And I have you go see this doctor. I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, mm. <laughs> and that's how they did it by blood test. And so they, so it's the same type of thing. You know, you have a, you know, a, a creatinine of 1.2, which is a little high, you know, it's like a blood sugar of 130, mm -hmm. you kind of like, you know, and then, and then to go back down to like my thing, I'd go back down to point normal, like the 0.5, which is back to blood sugar hundred. And then I kind of bounce up and down, up and down and they, they couldn't figure it out. So, um, I saw a special, special doctor, Dr. Gabriel Danovich at UCLA medical center. And I was his only pediatric patient. And he, um, he determined that there's a strep throat the strep, I had the streptococcal glomerular nephritis that causes my kidney would go up and down, up and down, up and down. And so when I was 21 in college, I had to have my first kidney transplant. Wow. So my, uh, my dad gave me a kidney, which was wonderful. And uh, so all my friends went, you know, hey, Rags, what'd you do for, you, do for uh, you know, winter break? Because in college, at my school, we had six-week winter breaks. You know, guys went to Europe, they went skiing and, you know, skiing in, you know, Colorado, but I was with you. Oh, I had a kidney transplant, you know, so I went to have my transplant, recover, went back to school. That's what I did. Wow. So. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. And you're, yeah. I'm sorry, you're, you, you mentioned a stepfather earlier, but your father gave you the. My father. Yeah. My, my father. Yeah. My yeah. father, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's insane. It, it, how did he make out the, for the rest of his life with one kidney? Oh, he's fine. He's so he's, uh, let's see, he's, let's see, he's 82 today. He's doing fine. He's working great. Um, no, he was working. He's he's retired now, but he was working full time, and he's had no problems. So, but, but then that kidney only. Well, I say only, but yeah. it lasted you yeah, seven, it lasted seven, yeah, seven, seven and a half years. Correct. Okay, and that. And the, uh, tell me about that process. So that process. So, so my dad gave me the kidney, and it was at that time it was really nerve wracking. And you're in the hospital for like two or three weeks, or four weeks. Now you're in the hospital for like five days, but um, and. So I had all the drugs and all that stuff. And I had this thing called chronic rejection. So my immune system is strong enough that it, it just overrode the drugs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, but I had a really good match with my dad. And that lasted seven years. And that kind of sucks when it fails. Cause you just, you just, uh, you know, starting over again. So you get the transplant and then it, it doesn't, it works great and you're feeling great and you know, doing all the stuff and da, da, da. 
and then uh, it fails and it uh it's kind of devastating at the time i've been through i've been through five total transplants so that was my first one and it uh yeah it was it was really tough but you just have to it's like with anything you got it's the mental attitude and how you deal with it you got to just deal with it you right. know and then I, so i went on i was on dialysis for about a year and a half and i got a kidney pancreas transplant when i was 27 and okay. that lasted for and that lasted for like 12 to 14 years something like that but uh well, it was great that my dad gave me that kidney that was wonderful that he was able to do that so no it's it's amazing yeah. i i actually wondered is there guilt when the kidney fails in you but you do you ever think oh it would have been fine in him or do you are you just happy for the seven years? I was happy. For, I think we talked about that early in, in, with the transplant. We were both happy with that because it gave me able to finish college. I was able to start work. I played sports. I did you know water polo and cycling. Still, I did all that kind of stuff. Went surfing. So I did all that, and um, so it gave me that time. Okay. Hey, be careful and, with that microphone, Rex. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. So, so you basically your dad's kidney got you to about twenty eight years old. Yeah, about correct. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, it's enough. I had a, yeah, I had, a, I had a kidney pancreas transplant. Um, okay. So if you need a kidney transplant, everyone out there, you should get the pancreas along with it because you got to take the same drugs. It's just surgery is a little more complicated, but if you have to do it, you might as well do both because then it's kind of, you don't have to have the diabetes for a little while. Right. So, which is great. so, okay. So you did at 28, you started dialysis. How long did that go before they found? Uh, um, more. I had, yeah, I had, uh, it was about a year and a half on the dialysis for that. Okay. And, so, um, yeah, that's dialysis isn't fun, but it's just kind of like anything, you know, I, um, that at that time I was doing dialysis three days a week. That's what you're allowed. This is the United States allows, um, later in my life, it's a different story, but I had, um, I did dialysis like six days a week because the more dialysis you do, the better you feel, the better your blood. It's like, you know, it's like doing more insulin, just mm -hmm. the better you to do, the more control you have. How um, were you doing it at a center or had they had it set yeah. up at your home? No, no. I, so my first, that, that time in 19, when I was like 28, 29, I had it, I did it in a uh, dialysis center. So, um, you know, went in three days a week, you know, and all that. And I'll never forget this guy that was there. He, he has an old. Head now to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to get an overview of the Dexcom G7, to find out how it works, to check into cost and coverage. And if you have Medicare, there's information for you there as well. Get your free benefits check today and get started with Dexcom. Manage diabetes confidently with the powerfully simple Dexcom G7. The Dexcom G7 is made for all types of diabetes type one, type two, and gestational. Make confident decisions with the Dexcom G7. Dexcom G7 can help you spend more time in range, which is proven to lower A1C. The more time you spend in range, the better and healthier you'll feel. Dexcom even offers a Dexcom Clarity app, which tracks your glucose trends and provides a projected A1C in as little as two weeks. The G7 is the most comfortable and discreet sensor that Dexcom has made to date, 60% smaller than its predecessor. Its small size and upper arm wear location will make it easy to forget that you're even wearing it. Set your alerts so you can keep track of where you want to be. My daughter's alerts are set at 70 and 120. And by the way, did you hear about this? Lightning fast 30 minute warm up with the G7. The Dexcom G7 warms up twice as fast as any other CGM system. So you'll have more time with your numbers. It also has a new 12 hour grace period, so you can swap your sensor when it's convenient for you. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Head over there now and get started. Seeing your blood sugar in real time, not just the number, but the speed and direction is a game changer when you are using insulin. I can't tell you how many great decisions we've made for my daughter over the years with the help of Dexcom. Are you using an accurate blood glucose meter? Do you know how much your test strips cost? Hmm, you don't know, do you? Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Head over there now and find out about the Contour Next Gen blood glucose meter. Contour makes a number of different meters. The Contour Next Gen, the Contour Next One, Next Easy. There's a bunch of them. They have a great lancing device, but those test strips, the Contour Next test strips, 
offer second chance sampling. That's going to help you to avoid wasting strips and uh, help you avoid errors on the machine. And, you know, you know, sometimes with some of those meters, you touch it and you don't get enough blood. It's like error, error. Mm. You touch the blood with a contour, you don't get enough blood. You go back and get more. And the result will still be incredibly accurate. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Contour meters are the way to go, in my opinion. My daughter's been using one for years. It is incredibly accurate, easy to use, easy to hold, has a nice bright light. The screen's easy to read. And if you want, you can pair the meter by Bluetooth to your phone. There's an app on, you could get an app on your phone. You see what I'm saying? And then that could help you keep track of all your data. It's a no brainer. Great meter, great test strips. It actually might be cheaper in cash than you're paying now for the meter you get through your insurance company. Check it out or ask your doctor, but whatever you do, use my links. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com to these and all of the sponsors. When you click on the links, you're supporting the show and keeping it free and plentiful. And I thank you for that. I'll never forget this guy that was there. He, he had this hat that said, uh, attitude is everything. And that really stuck with me. Mm. So that was really cool because, you know, you can get down and down and out and depressed about any of your conditions you have. But if you have a good attitude about it, then it's just like, oh, I got to deal with this. It's not, it's not the end of the road or end of life. It's just something you got to do. Yeah, Rags, I think of you as a happy person with our interactions yeah. that we've had. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so walk me through it a little bit go to so you go to the dialysis center you can't drive home so you need a ride i imagine no i would um i would i got to a point where i was i would uh sometimes i'd ride my bike there sometimes i would um drive there because i was working at the time i was working at ucla medical center and like cardiac care unit and um so i was doing di- I, it was great because the hospital had three days sh- three day a week shifts so i do dialysis like monday wednesday friday and i'd work tuesday thursday saturday and sometimes I would, uh, I would, you know, when I first started, I would just, I'd drive and my dad would drive me and stuff like that. But then I got kind of comfortable with it. And so then I just was just living life and I had to go do this treatment and I'd go do it and then be done, you know, okay. and then uh, go to work, then work. How long are you there? Like, so they, so you have a port, I would imagine, right? They give you. Yeah. They have a thing called the AV fistula. So they take an, an in your arm, in your wrist or in your, in your um, bicep, there's a artery and a vein and they put them together. And they make one vessel out of that. And so um, it's one vessel is called the AV fistula. And they put a needle in the, in the lower part of it. And then that's where the atrium, where the blood goes out of your body, out of your body through the machine. And it comes back into the needle above, in the upper part of your arm. And that's the venous side. So it goes through the, and it goes to the blood, goes through a filter, the high, high functioning a reverse osmosis filter. And then it goes, gets clean and it comes back into your body. Yeah, that, so they're literally removing the blood from your body, cleaning mm-hmm. it, and putting it back. Yeah, in. and they clean it by doing a salt exchange. So what happens is, if you say your potassium level is high, let's say you have a five of uh, uh, six six milligram potassium level, so they put a high concentration of bath in there, so because salt will flow from a high flow to a low flow, so they will put like three in there, like three milligrams of potassium, so the salt will come across. And get, and get removed out, out of your body. Jeez, it's amazing somebody figured out how to do that. Uh, it, is, yeah. it quite is a, really is amazing. When you need when you need dialysis, do you feel your um, do you feel your energy lowering? Like, how do you know it's been a while mm-hmm. since you've had it? Yeah, you. Um, it's kind of like you're really. It's like having a really high blood sugar or feeling after you've been really low, and you feel just kind of lethargic and tired and. You don't have any energy and you have a hard time thinking about things like get, doing tasks. Mm-hmm. So it, it, yeah, it can, it can wipe you out. It's really wipes you out. And the, so, day, the day after the process, you're okay to, to live your yeah, life. I, I, was, I, I was okay. I felt good. Some people aren't, but I, I was at the time I was young and I felt good. So yeah, yeah. I just kind of made myself do it anyways too. <laughs> so it's like, you know, right. Like, wow. So you did that for a year and a half, year and a half. Then mm-hmm. you got 
two new kidneys and a pancreas? No, no I got it. Just so they took the old one out because it was uh, rejecting. So they don't want to have an immune response. So they took the old kidney out. Oh, okay. And I got a, I got a new one, a kidney and a pancreas from the same person from a African American lady in short in, uh, in Arizona. I got her kidneys, and uh, kidney and pancreas, and that lasted for a long time. That was that was really hard. though. when I first got out of surgery, I was like, "Why did I do this?" It felt like I got hit by a Mack truck. Mm. But it worked right away. It was amazing. So you, to, you know, you woke up from that surgery. You didn't have diabetes anymore. No. Wow. How so that- so so I don't know if I've actually had diabetes for fifty one years. Do I need to like subtract the amount of time I had the kidney pancreas? Shrimp? I don't know. I was, yeah, I yeah. That seems. That- <laughs> <laughs> What do they call that? Stolen valor? Have you? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, from 1997 until when? 99. I think like 97 to. God, what would it be? 30, 98, 99, 1,000. Yeah. Like, like 20, like 2010, maybe something like that. 2011. Okay. So you got, yeah, no, so no, sorry. 2012 is cause I, I stopped. Yeah. So I got, so yeah, 2012, sorry. 2012. So you, so you got 15 years with no diabetes, uh, but yeah. And, and, but you're taking anti-rejection medications during that. Yes. Time, right. And I imagine yes. you still do because you have the kidneys still. Yeah. I have the new, I have a new kidney. Okay. I got a new one. So yeah. what, what are the anti-rejection meds like? Um, well, they're okay. It's, it's just like taking, it's like any medicine you have to take. It's, um, when you first take, when you first take your, your transplant medications, there's a lot of them. So you have like antifungal, antibacterial, um, antiviral, your Prograf, your Prograf is the main, main drug. Your immune system has like 12 channels. No, I'm not a doctor, but has 12 channels. And, um, uh, so the, 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 they're called interleukins and each one of the transplant drugs, one's uh Prograf, one is my and one is prednisone. Prednisone is the anti-inflammatory, but my and Prograf um, block those highways. So it's like you have a big highway coming down. I don't know wherever you live, and they could just put a block in the highway. So then that that immune system response can't really happen, or weakens it. And so that's what those drugs do. And, and those drugs have side effects. Um, the Prograf drug is the main drug. You get you can get a thing called tremor when you have too much of it in your body. It makes you feel a little loopy, a little anxiety. And then my Fortic has, you have side effects you have is, is like, like stomach issues, GI distress, stomach stuff. Mm-hmm. And prednisone, if you have too much of it, can make you really, really crazy. Like what my last, my transplant in college, um, when it was rejecting, um, I got up in the like two o'clock in the morning and cleaned my bathroom, uh, the kitchen floor with a toothbrush, you know, and organized all my college notes. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got a, um, uh, a steroid pack, I don't know, a few months ago. For yeah. something, I got bit by something. Anyway, it's a boring story. Actually, it's a great story, but it doesn't yeah. fit here. Yeah. Uh, but I, <laughs> but I got put on the pack, and the pharmacist messed up the um the script, uh-huh. and oh, had wow. me take way too many um <sighs> at, up front. And I I figured it out about forty eight hours in because I felt like Superman. Yeah, I was like, there, <laughs> my body had no aches or pains or creaks, and I had all this crazy energy, and I was like, what the hell's going on? Okay. And and so I dumped out the pills. And looked at the rest of the dosing schedule, and I was like, I don't have enough pills to get through this. Right. So I had taken way too many up front. It is oh, astonishing no. how quickly that yeah. feeling got to me. Yeah, and then also like it makes you really emotional too. So you can like you watch a Hallmark commercial, like a dog and the, you know mom or whatever, and you start crying, <laughs> or you get really angry, or snap really quickly at your wife or your kid. You know, like yeah. you get really like edgy. You gotta like learn to bite your tongue. No, that's just saying. So, um, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Well, okay, so I guess I need to ask you, you've had diabetes, not had it, and gotten it back again. Yeah, so and- that's the story that's interesting. Well, I got it back. So when I had my pancreas transplant, I was like you when you had your Dexcom. I would do, I would do eat, like have a Coke and do a blood sugar test. It would be like 80. Like, you know, after a Coke, it would be like 80. And I'd eat something, whatever, another like 80, 90, 80, 90. So finally, one time I did, I, I wasn't feeling that good. My kidney started rejecting. So I did a test and my blood sugar was like 180. So I'm like, oh, shit, this is, re-, you know, pancreas is starting to reject. So I went to the pharmacy, bought some insulin at the pharmacy, <laughs> some needles, and gave myself a shot. And then, um, and then the doctor said, oh, they gave me metformin and some other drugs tried to slow it down. And just did, so it ended up rejecting. But, but yeah, so that was interesting because I, when I was a camp counselor, I would go to this, uh, we had this thing called, um, 
we talked to other families, uh, like you know, the whole bunch of diabetics on this board and the family camp, we'd have the parents would come and talk to us about our experiences and stuff. And I'll never forget, I finally understood my, why my mom and dad always asked how I was doing. It's because they cared. It wasn't because they were trying to get on me. Yeah. So that was really important for me to understand that. So when I, so I really understood that even more so after I got, now I know it was like, because I grew up with it, I didn't know what it was like to get it, but now I did know what it was like to get it. And at least I know what to do ahead of time. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, it was still pretty, you know, I was like, oh, dang it, not again, you know? So anyways. <laughs> yeah, I do my best to make sure Arden knows why, you know, like she yeah. she texted me back kind of short recently. Yeah. And I think I responded with something like, I know you don't want me involved in this as much as I am at the moment. I'm sorry that this is what's happening, but you know, I love you and yeah. we're not going to let you not be okay. So yeah, no, that's yeah. better. I mean, if my parents had had the tools and stuff that's available today, I think things would have been much better for them and for me. I think it would have been a lot more. Um, yeah. Well, they had the, um, you know? they had the motivation and the desire. Yeah. They just didn't have yeah. anything to work with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Hey, so that yeah. that pancreas after the transplant was it rejected or did you get diabetes again? No, yeah, so it rejected. So the trans the transplant was they don't they leave it in your body, um, but it's I was diabetic right away again, type one. Okay, yeah, no type two, unfortunately. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you're, you're, you're like, I'll take anything I can get. Um, yeah, you so, but those, um. Those kidneys didn't last either, though, right? You got another surgery after that, or am yeah, I? Yeah. So then, so then after, so then I waited. Um, so that one happened. Yeah, and then so after ten years, I was on t- ten years on dialysis, and um, so I was working full time in my 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 pacemaker job. And I was selling medical devices and stuff, and going to surgeries and all that kind of stuff. And um, they had home hemodialysis, so I did work all day, come home, do dialysis, get up, go work again. I did that, but I was doing that like six, six, seven days a week because there was a study done in, if, no, I'm not, remember, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I think there was a study done in Italy where they did quality of life compared to the amount of hours of dialysis. And they found out if you have 15 hours of dialysis or more, your quality of life will be pretty normal. So on home dialysis, you can do, you do three days, uh, three hours a day. So you do like, you know, like, 18 to 21 hours a week. Sometimes I do 23 hours a week. So I felt pretty good. I was doing triathlons on, on dialysis and surfing and working and everything like that. So, hmm. um, so the more you do, the better it is. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, anyways. Can, can I ask some more, more like psychological questions about ha- yeah, yeah, having it, not having it for so long and then having it again? Yeah. Yeah. It, is it harder the second time or do you, because you were so young the first time, did it feel like, I, I just, I can't imagine. I don't know the right questions to ask here, right? Yeah, like, so, you know what so, I mean? So, yes, yeah, so I know what you mean. So, so, so it wasn't, it was a bummer and I was disappointed, but I knew exactly what to do because of the camp I went to when I was a kid, Bearskin Meadow Camp, I was taught how to live well with diabetes. So I had this, all this education from, you know, through the years of having to deal with this condition. And, and so I was able to step back in pretty quickly. I was pretty bummed because I couldn't go you know, eat, you know, the, the sushi rice or whatever else or whatever else. Um, I think that for me, it was harder was the dialysis than the diabetes. Because I got to a point with diabetes that was, you know, relatively pretty in control of the ultra lente and all that stuff. And then I had the pancreas. So, um, you know, so I went back to camp, called camp. It took me forever to get an insulin pump. And I had the first Dexcom. I, mean, I thought that was amazing, that, mm-hmm. that, that technology, both of it. But that, no one told me at the hospital I was at to use uh, fast-acting insulin, so I used old regular insulin. And um, it didn't work too well with the pump. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> um, the, the, but yeah, so it was, it, was, it was difficult, but it wasn't unmanageable. I wasn't depressed or anything like that. I was more depressed about losing the kidney than I was about the, the diabetes. Because the the diabetes is manageable on site and the kidney means dialysis again. Exactly. And it really interrupts your life more so than diabetes because diabetes, I can still go you know, do, do stuff, you know, just, mm-hmm. I just got to take my, my butt pack that I have, you know, <laughs> I yeah. still have the same kind of stuff I had when I was a kid. And my mom in high school, I had an orange butt pack. And now I have a black one. Anyway, so I just put all my sugar and stuff in there. I, uh, when my friend Mike was getting uh, dialysis, 
I feel like his life was either getting dialysis or recovering from dialysis. Right. You know, he, he got to the point where he couldn't work. And, yeah. And what, and when, what, what, what time, what time was that in like the eighties or no, uh, well, I mean, he's been gone a couple of years now, but yeah. he'd been, he'd been doing it for a while prior yeah. to that. I'd say in, I mean, this was, you know, still in the two thousands, uh, yeah. 2010 around, I would imagine he started. And, uh, but I just, his life, like it started off like, oh, I'm working, but I'm getting dialysis. And then it slowly went to, I can't go to work anymore. And then his life yeah. was, just felt like it was going to dialysis and recovering from dialysis. Yes. Yeah, Cause like, at least with, with diabetes, you can eat anything you want pretty much, you know, on dialysis, you got to be really careful what salt you eat, potassium you have, what phosphorus you have. You got to take your phosphate binders. You got all this other stuff to do. Mm. So with diabetes and dialysis, it is quite a, a, a burden, but you got to, uh, what I did when I was successful with it, because I just kind of broke it down to like you, you know, how we learned here, how to like diabetes that has a certain set of rules that you have to kind of follow. Mm -hmm. And so does dialysis. You have to certain, you know, because if you don't pay attention, you'll pay with tension. So I'd rather, you know, pay attention. And I did the best. I don't, I'm not perfect. You know, I, I'd mess up on my dialysis treatments. I mean, not treatments, but on my care and my diabetes care, I still kind of mess up, you know? No. Oops, yeah. I, I, sitting here thinking about Mike, he wasn't, he didn't, uh, he wasn't great at his diabetes. Like, I don't think yeah. it was effort. I just don't think he used old insulin way too long. Um, when they tried to get him to Novolog, he was just out of his depth. He didn't have any sensor technology. I tried to talk to him about it, but he did not like, he did not right. like talking about his diabetes. Um, and, uh, he just, he struggled every which way, Like you know, it was, um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not even sure what to yeah. say. Yeah, it was frustrating that yeah that he, you know, he had a problem. His, you know, different than yours. His problem led yeah. to his need for kidney, you know, for right. dialysis. And still, as he's getting the dialysis, he still doesn't know. Like nobody ever stopped to teach him about his diabetes. See, that's terrible to me. Like yeah. you know, this is you know, like like cause, you know, I thank God for all the doctors and nurses and clinicians, but sometimes they forget that you're actually dealing with this every on a a daily basis and you need to know the information properly to be able to yeah. help you help you control it. it's kind of uncontrollable but help you control it so and you know and, and i don't know i haven't talked to anybody that has diabetes from a dialysis from diabetes ever really but i would imagine that's pretty depressing because you get you know my diabetes can take care of that and i'm on dialysis and then it's kind of a downward spiral you know well what i always imagined too was that his lack of knowledge caused it and he's aware he doesn't do a good job with his diabetes. And now it's like you're bailing out a boat with a thimble. And you know, on the other side of it, you're still, you, yeah. you, know, you know, better with your insulin than you were before. So, right. you know, and then from there, I mean, I don't know if, you know, through our conversations, he never mentioned that his, his heart and, um, right. and that in the end is what failed. Yeah. So that, know, that's probably from the dialysis more than the, the kidney stuff. Cause you, all your, your salts, your potassium, and all your other stuff gets messed up. So really, and then, well, then with the diabetes too, with the high blood sugars, and you know, like you, you always mention about the razors going through your veins, you know. So yeah, those two things together are not a yeah not, not a great couple, huh? Yeah, I had a really good friend of mine who had um, a kidney pancreas transplant. And she was diabetic for a long time, and um, she uh, after a year and a half of having a kidney pancreas transplant, she had a, a massive heart attack and passed away. Mm -hmm. So. You know, yeah. and she took care of her diabetes. So, right. Who knows? You know, I don't, yeah, it's, uh, so. it's, uh, not great. So, um, yeah. but anyway, sorry. I don't know. I, I'm yeah. not good at talking about Mike. It messes me up. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. I, yeah. I, under, I understand that. That's, you know, um, totally well, get that. Yeah. Close so, friend, friend of yours, you know? Yeah. So. Um, well, let me ask you this then. So, when do you, like, you're, you're looping now. How long have you been doing yeah. that? I've been doing it. Oh God, like two, let's see, before the pandemic. So yeah, I was by my own pause. I think when did, when did looping come out? I came out like a, I came out like six months to a year after that, maybe like 2019, maybe 2018, 2019. Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Cause I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't remember. I, it's, it's been long enough now that I've been doing it for a long time. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, it still drives me. I still don't have, I still try to get things dialed in. I just, it's, it's a, uh, 
you know, I, I was learning, I was talking to this other doctor I have, a private doctor I, I pay for. Um, he's diabetic as well. And he was telling me with us older diabetics is that we try to outthink the technology because our whole life with technology with diabetes, we always had to outthink the technology to try mm-hmm. to make it better. So when you try to do it off loop, you get in trouble, you know? Yeah. So, I know you gotta let just, you gotta let loop do its thing. I'm looking here. I'm seeing I'm seeing YouTube videos from Katie in 2018, and I'm go- okay. Yeah, I well, and then there's here's an article from 2016. Yeah, so I had to be like 2019. I think I st- 20 like late 2018 or 2019 because what happened was I I had. I, you know, so it's probably 2019 because 2018, my animus pump, I couldn't read the screen anymore. So I needed to get a new insulin pump. Mm-hmm. So I, I try to keep that thing as long as I could, of course. So then I said, I told my doctor, I want to do this looping thing that we had to buy the old pump. So it was before the, the loop came out, before the Omnipod came out with loop. And so I told my doctor, she's like, oh, no, do that. So I tried the, the 670G Medtronic, okay. which drove me nuts. I mean, I, I was able to run a half marathon on it and I, I eventually figured it out, but it was just oversold to me. So I, I got frustrated because I had the Dexcom for so long. So I finally went back to using Dexcom and making the electronic to just a pump. Okay. And then I got the loop, which was, which was amazing to me. So. Yeah. This, this article from 2016 is from Dana Lewis and she was on the show and her, and her husband was on years ago, like around that time. And this was open APS that they were dealing. Yeah, that they were doing. I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really, really something. It just, I mean, even that's been. I mean, what is that? Twenty sixteen from Dana's thing. Seventeen, eighteen, yeah. twenty, twenty two. I mean, you know, we're already seven or eight years into it. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. And so you found it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been uh, up on because I worked for a medical device industry for so long for pacemakers and defibrillators and all that kind of stuff. I've really believed in medical technology, so. I've always tried to be really on top of what the newest diabetes thing was. Mm. So only thing is I had the ultra lente. I never went to a pump and uh, probably should not earlier, but I never did. Um, so I always tried being kind of, because what, you know, you got to be open to the new technology because it's, it's, it works. I, I think, you know? Yeah, like, no, I agree. So, I mean, so what, what have your outcomes been like? Like, what were they like going through your life? What do you remember your A1Cs being as you were growing up? I don't remember my A1Cs growing up. I used to BS my blood sugar with my doctor and use different pens and pencils for the log book, put, put blood sugars in, you know? And I think he, he knew what was going on. He was a pretty smart guy. So, um, Rags, so are you saying that you were, you would switch your writing implement to make it look like you were honestly keeping uh-huh. the book? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't just use the same pen. You'll know I did it all in the same uh, afternoon. <laughs> exactly. You know? So. so, but so he saw, he sees your logbook, but he sees your test results as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he, and he would say, Hey, you got to do a better job. But I think it was like, when I was younger, hard to say, I, I don't even know when the A1C started coming out. So. But as a teenager and through high school, I was trying, but we still weren't know what we were doing. But when I started the ultra lengthy, I got the A1Cs. I was probably like started in the eights and then it came down like sevens, like mid seven. I was probably mostly mid sevens, eights the whole time there for mm-hmm. a while. And then I had the pancreas transplant. So that was good. And then the loop has been, has been, I've been, my last one was 5.0, but I don't know if I believe that too much because. Um, my Dexcom says I was like one, like 6.2. So I kind of believe the 6.2 more than the 5.0 for some reason. Because mm-hmm. if, if you have with it, with kidney transplant, if you have it, you usually have anemia. So when you have anemia, make sure your A1C is a lot lower. So. I see. Well, I have a little blurb here from you from the NIH. Uh, yeah. Uh, the ADA has now acknowledged, oh my God, glycohemoglobin A1C as a diagnostic criterion for diabetes mellitus. Uh, for the first time since the publication of the ADA's guidelines in 97. And this article wow. was written in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like maybe 1997 and then 2012 looks like when they, st- oh no, wait, the American Diabetes Association guidelines, first diagnostic guidelines, July of 1997. Thus the current revised criteria for diabetes diagnosis and screening as of January, 2010 are. Oh, this is this is you know how they move the they yeah. move the needle all the time on where your A one C should be. You know, every year they're like, Well, maybe it should be here, maybe it should be here, yeah. you should be shooting for this, you know. 
It's funny. Yeah. What, what I don't get, like from your, 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 um, once you've had about people that have had, have had pregnancies and their A1Cs are like five to 5.2 or whatever. And then they leave their pregnancy and they're like, oh, you go back, you're fine back to seven and a, seven and a half. I'm like, well, five is good. Why not keep it there? I don't know. I don't well, I never also that. using this as a, you know, so the, I think what happened, Listen, I have no idea. But what yeah. it seems like to me is that as technology gets better and the possibility for people to take care of themselves gets easier and more widespread, then they move down the the the, to, the, the target. But what ends up happening is, is that you meet a person in their 40s who's like, look, my A1C is seven and a half. It's right where my doctor wants it. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. from a conversation you had with him 15 years ago. Yeah. You, you know, and and he's let go of you now. Like he doesn't he doesn't for some reason come back to you and say, Hey, look, the guidelines have moved. Go for seven, go for six and yeah. a half. Like that. It's interesting. Everybody kind of gets stuck somewhere, wherever yeah. they start, maybe, or wherever they get comfortable. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, there'll be a day when the ADA says your, you know, your guidelines are, you know, you're looking for five point five or something like that. Yeah. So it'll you know, but to your point, I, the pregnancy thing is always fascinating. They're like you yeah. cannot make a baby with an A1C of blah blah blah. Get it to this. And then the baby yeah. comes out and they're like, all right, relax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to where you were. It's all fine. Yeah, you know? It's all fine. It's yeah. All, yeah. A lot of a lot of it's just I mean, a lot of it's just based on on human nature, honestly. Yeah. And what and what we know people are um willing or capable of doing, I guess, depending on who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, I mean, what would you what would you tell people about a transplant? Like, would you say go for it? Yeah, if, if you can get to me, I've had I mean, I had so after my kidney pancreas transplant, my cousin gave me a kidney and only lasted a week. So then I waited another uh yeah, so that one lasted a week. Then I, yeah, so that one I wasted I waited ten years. Wow. And in 2019, yeah, 2019, I got a, I got a kidney transplant from a donor in New York and that one failed in, so in the middle of the pandemic, my wife and I went hiking and stuff. And then I came back and I could tell I wasn't doing well. I was really tired. So I went and my kidney was failing. So I had to go into the hospital in like July of 2020. I'm like, this isn't, you know, fun. So I did that, had the biopsy. They said, oh, it's, you know, it's not working right, but it's not rejecting. So, you know. So then this one failed actually last December in December, 2020, no, December, 2021. And then, and so on two twenty two twenty two, I got the call for a new kidney transplant, the one I have now from a 22 year old kid in, in Santa Cruz. Hmm. So this one is really, was working very well. So I'm pretty excited about that. How, um, a couple of questions. What's the longest time you went without a functioning kidney? Uh, 10 years, it's so 10 years of dialysis. Yeah. In one How, and, and what's the process of getting on the donor list? So that, so you have to, a couple things. One is you have to, you know, go to see your nephrologist, the transplant doctors, and they have to help you put you on the list. Um, if you're on dialysis, you get on the list even a little quicker, but if your kidney is failing, they put you on the list. So there's a the whole process that uh, paperwork, I don't know. They have to do a whole thing. Um, you get, when you're on dialysis, you get, um, Medicare insurance. So if you had private insurance, you also get Medicare insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, you can think Nick, Nixon did that actually. Um, and then, then after that, you have to make sure that you, um, you know, are doing your dialysis treatments properly. Like you're being compliant with your dialysis treatments, with your diet, with your medications, everything. You have to be really compliant with everything. And if you're overweight, you have to lose weight. They have to be really compliant and show that you're willing to take care of it. If you can't take care when you're on dialysis, you can't take care of the trans, they won't think you can take care of the transplant. So you have to show that you're able to do that. I see. And that's kind of the biggest thing, I think. And, and, you know, and so now the transplants have become, you know, when I first had my first one, I think I was in the hospital, like three weeks to a month, whatever. And this last time I was in the hospital for a week, you know, so. Hmm. Um, it's really ch- things like, like with diabetes management, it's really changed a lot. And the drugs are a lot stronger, um, to suppress your immune system. Do you ever, but get, sometimes oh, I'm that, sorry. Sorry. I was going to say, do you get sick because of that? Or what did COVID freak you out or COVID really freaked me out? Cause I had a transplant. So I was taking transplant immunosuppressive drugs. So, you know, I'd get a 
sniffle or sore throat or you know we live in family live by the beach i'm like oh god i have covid you know i do you know and everything else was fine didn't have a fever or anything like that so that was kind of nerve-wracking for me yeah not not so much now now i'm a little more you know there's there you have a mask you have um vaccines you have treatment there's the whole flu of thing compared to when we first started then mm-hmm. yeah and I used, I used to listen to you uh, during that whole time i was just, yeah doing like two or three shows a week whatever it was so i was listening every every time thank you i yeah, appreciate that, that. Uh, yeah. what about um longevity like how what what are your expectations the doctors talk to you about like life no, expectancy not not no i hope they live be you know in my 80s 90s that's what i hope yeah um take care of myself uh but with the transplant longevity for instance they they you know most of them last about a year and then after that you know a certain amount percentages kind of go up go lower as you get longer out but you get the five years and you're the, so the first most, most important year is the first year and then the next milestone is five years now so that's 10 years and then 15 so mm-hmm. um so it, it they can last you know i've had them last 14 you know like whatever 14 years and one lasted a week so just has to do with the immune system more than anything. And you have to be compliant taking your drugs too. You have to take your medication. Right. What about um, uh, psychologically, is there a difference between receiving a donor from like a live donor who you know versus um, uh, I'm assuming somebody who's passed mm-hmm. away passed. suddenly? Yes, definitely. Because my cousin Eric gave me a, um, a kidney you know, and it was all excited. <clears throat> so the month before my kid was family, I went to Hawaii for like three weeks. And I came back and got the transplant for my cousin. And it only lasted a week. And so we were both, it was just devastating. It was just, I took his, you know, he gratefully gave me his kidney and the kidney didn't take. So I felt bad. He felt bad. We both thought it was our fault that the thing didn't work out. Yeah. And it was just science. It was had nothing to do with that. But it, it is, whereas if you get a, a, a cadaveric, transplant or someone who's passed there's no person's already passed away so there's no to me there's no it's easier to deal with personally with psychologically with that because my cousin now only has one kidney so i'm always worried about him losing his kidney and going on dialysis like hey are you drinking your water are you you know blah 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 yeah so um that's that's kind of an important yeah that's a definitely different for me but the the thing is the living donors last longer so my dad gave me a kidney for instance you know and he's he's been I was 21 and he was 51. So he's been, you know, 31 years ago, 31 years and he's doing fine. Yeah. You know, so hey, does your cousin get better gifts at the holidays than other people in your family? I, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, from you, I meant from you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's that? What's that like to approach a person and ask for that? Well, you know, because you always tell people you need a transplant. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then rubber hits the road and it doesn't really happen. But um, you put it out there and, you know, you hope for the best. And it's it, 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 asking drugs, like what my dad, my my father helped me. Like he would ask the family, you know, hey, does anyone get right in our kidney? And then I would talk to that person. And, uh, you know, are you okay with it? It's, and it, you got to be okay with if the person says no, or if they say you just change their mind at the last minute, mm-hmm. you have to be okay with that. It's, it's okay. It's their decision, you know? Yeah. So, but it, it is a little bizarre, you know, but, uh, I mean, if my, if it was my kids, I think I'm, I can, I, I imagine I'd be yeah. okay with that. Another, right. I, I'll tell you, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would say if another person asked me, Yeah. It, you know, it really would be an incredibly difficult thing to think through. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, well, it's, it's a kindness really anybody who's done something like that for somebody. Yeah. It's really yeah. It's, it's, un- it's unbelievable, you yeah. know, and I've had, you know, I, I put, when I used to do my, my runs, my 10 Ks and my half marathons and stuff, I'd wear a thing that says, I need a kidney transplant. I, I said, I need a kidney. I put my phone number on it. Never got a call from that, but I always hope I would. <laughs> I'll tell you what. That'd be amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. so he's like, that guy in the t-shirt needs a kidney. I'll give him a call. Yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, so that well, listen, cool, but- we, we sold something on a Christmas card one year. So I don't think yeah. I've ever told this story. I'll give it to you yeah. really, really quickly. Okay. We bought yeah. this when we bought our first home. It was this little crappy house yeah. uh, on a really nice piece of property. And it was always our intention to just knock the house over and build back in that space. Right. So we we finally got into a situation where we could 
I'm saying afford, but we, you know, it's not like we paid cash. We took out loans, right. but we could, we could make it happen. Right. We actually could, we're able to borrow the money to build the house, but right. we couldn't afford anything extra. And so we didn't know where to live while this was happening. And it was going to right. stymie us. We were going to like end up not building the house because we had nowhere to go. We had two kids at that point and right. a, a dog and there was, you know, all of us. And one day I called my wife at work and I said, I think I know what we can do to build the house. And she goes, what? I said, we can buy a travel trailer and have it put on the property and we can live in the trailer while the house is being built. And she's yeah. like, you're out of your mind. And I'm like, that's the only way we're getting this done. Because even renting like a condo locally was <laughs> insane. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it wasn't going to work. And we couldn't, we don't live near family uh, a reasonable distance. The kids were in school, et cetera. So we did this, we bought this, like, and I forget how big it was. It was huge. And it had like, it yeah. slid out on the side, but the payments on it were only like $89 a month. So great. you get it yeah. delivered, you hook it up to the sewer and the water, the township says it's okay. We, you know, talk about it with our neighbors and we're like, look, we're sorry about this, but we're going to live in a trailer in our backyard for about six months. And, um, but then as soon as you're done with it and the house is finished, we don't want this trailer. Right. And I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> so it was the holidays and we took a photo of it. I did. I cannot blame Kelly for this. Although then I get all the credit because it worked. Right. So I took a photo of it and we put it on the front of our Christmas card. And the front of our Christmas card said for sale. And then it had all the information about the trailer inside. <laughs> it said serious inquiries only. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and we sent it out to everyone. And Kelly's cousin's wife's parents bought our trailer wow so, that's great so i'm saying i probably would have put the phone number on the t-shirt too <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's worth a shot worth uh, a shot exactly yeah. i'm so thrilled to get rid of that trailer not as happy yeah. as you would have been to get a kidney but you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i got you yeah i you know pretty yeah, excited it's, it's, it was a wait so it was yeah. like it was the, well first of all we were paying for it second of all we didn't have anywhere to put it so, yeah. like, our neighbors were like, okay, so the house is done. What are you doing with that? And I'm like, oh, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. I have a plan that involves my holiday card. It's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I still can't believe that worked, Rex, actually, being honest oh, with that's, you. That's great. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to? Um, I just wanted to say, one thing I wanted to say was that, you know, Sometimes you have diabetes to me as a condition more so than a disease because it's, it's uh, had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have other diseases or conditions this, that wasn't caused by your diabetes. It's just another disease you have, you know? So um, it's not the diabetes fault or your fault or something. I just wanted to say that, that, you know, sometimes people have other stuff that has nothing to do with the diabetes. It's just, you know, luck of the, luck of the draw. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got vitiligo like, five years ago i was like really okay so you know <laughs> hey great this is yeah. great yeah yeah wow. this is great yeah super yeah nothing get rid of it yeah and and uh i don't know just uh yeah just i think it, diabetes is it's a life you know life not lifelong but you know whatever we have to do we have to do it and, and you have to be positive, try to be positive about it. It gets, it, you know, we all go through our ups and downs with the condition, but it's, uh, it's a, uh, it's a process. It's part of the journey, not, you know, the end result, of course, is having great blood sugars, but if you sometimes have a out of normal range blood sugar, the, like yesterday I'm running out of pods, right? So I have one, I have two pods left and then of course the insurance is backed up. So yesterday my, my, my sugars are like, like 190 even to 200, 220. And I'm like, can't, I keep going like doing 10 units of insulin and trying to bring it down, but I don't want to lose the pot. because I have one pot left. So mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff happens, you know, or, yeah. or, you know, well, what's what happens. Your, so you're, you're saying a lot here, but you're not saying what you mean. I don't think. So what is, yeah. what, what do you, what's your message? Oh, well, my message with, with diabetes is just take it, take it, take it as it comes and don't try to live in the results too much. If you have a blood sugar of 300, like Arden did the, yesterday or the other day, that's just the number. It's not a reflection on who you are. Yeah, so you got to fix it and yeah. move on. You can't, you can't yeah. look backwards and, and yeah. beat yourself up. That's, uh, not, that's not okay. You know, you're going to, yeah. you're going to end up causing yourself more problems that way. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, you said something earlier, too. I, I, I slipped my mind. But it was akin to when I tell people, like, do a little work now to save a lot of work later. Yeah. And something about tension. What did you say? In, what did you say? Oh, yeah. Say, so, yeah. My dad told me some of this. If you don't pay attention, you'll pay with tension. Wow. He's, it's brilliant. Like it's, it's yeah. simple and it's brilliant at the same time. Just, yeah. uh, I, all I wanted to tell Arden yesterday was if you just take five minutes now, you're going to save the whole day. Yeah. And Easy. she, you know, in her mind, she was busy or in class or doing something and she didn't have that time. So I, I, I but I'm not going to hit her with it now. Like I'll wait yeah. until she's home and we're talking and I'll bring it up and I'll be like, Hey, here's a great example of, because that's a lesson she needs. She really has to learn. It is exactly. Yeah. It's the lesson your dad was telling you. So yeah, exactly. And it took me a long time to learn that lesson. School hard knocks, you know. So yeah, no, um, I know. I wish it was easier for people to learn. But. Uh, yeah, and you know, and and there's you know, the, thank God for the technology too to be able to, you know, oh, see that I'm getting oh, low. Please, unbelievable. If this was twenty twenty years ago, Arden wouldn't know what her blood sugar was. Uh, yeah, you know, like she wouldn't. If she felt okay, she wouldn't have tested while she was at school. Yeah. You know, so we know because of the technology. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Hey, one time I had an insulin reaction in class uh, back in college, but whatever. That was fun. <laughs> there was paramedics, paramedics around me. I was like, oh, you know. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, everything that I've done, Rags, is trying to set Arden up to not be the kid yeah. who passed out at college. So, yeah. 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 Well, she's she's doing pretty well in Illinois, right? She's in Chicago. <laughs> Are you being funny? Yes. <laughs> yes. She's in Chicago doing great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Getting ready for the winter. Yeah. Okay, so one more, one more thing. I am looking for a job. So any medical device companies out there, you can give me a call. Oh, no kidding. What kind of work do you do? Um, I used to sell cardiac pacemakers and defibrillators, but I like, I'm like a medical sales rep. So okay. whatever. All right. Well, you know? I'll tell you what. I don't know when this is going up, but. But hey, if somebody, it's all good. If somebody hears it, contact <laughs> me and I'll I'll move you on to Rex. Thank you. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this with me. I really do appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. I appreciate it. I have a note from Rags that I'll read at the end. But first, let me thank Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G7 Continuous Glucose Monitor. And remind you to go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to learn more and get started. I'm also going to thank Contour, makers of the Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter. You can use the same brand of meter that Arden does by going to contournext.com forward slash juice box. Those second chance test strips, you don't want to miss out on them. Don't forget to check out the private Facebook group, Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes, and all the great series within the podcast, which you can find at juiceboxpodcast.com or in the feature tab of the private Facebook group. So Rags sent me this great email kind of updating me on everything. And he was worried that, I'm going to use his words. I'm worried I made kidney disease sound easy and nonchalant, which the opposite is true. Basically, he just doesn't want anybody to think that this stuff is simple or that he was trying to make it sound easy because he said that is not the case. Anyway, Rags, I thought you were terrific. I love this episode, and I appreciate you being concerned for everybody else. But I believe the honesty of your story came through. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.